This is the BrainX podcast. At the BrainX, we are solely devoted to science and its beauty in its purest form. This podcast is just one among other endeavors of the BrainX project. We aim to raise the scientific consciousness of India by connecting people to the romance in the process of scientific discovery. Do visit us at thebrainx.org. That is thebrainx.org and our social media handles for more. For a very long time, I have had this particular feeling, this this thought in my mind. Why is the country's scientific output not satisfactory of India's? I have asked this question to many people. I never got a very satisfactory answer. Why India's scientific output is not satisfactory? What is the reason? What is resisting us? What is impeding us? I mean, after perusing through a long list of international awards given to scientists from across the world, I barely found the names of Indian scientists. Most of the Nobel laureates are either American or European by nationality. It can't be, you know, Sweden's politics. It can't be West's politics because had it been so, Rishi Sunak wouldn't have been the Prime Minister of United Kingdom. Kamala Harris wouldn't have been uh, the America's Vice President. Or Sundar Pichai wouldn't have been Google's CEO. Or even today, you know, there was a tweet I saw, Elon Musk. He wouldn't have called Viveka Ramaswamy a promising candidate for 2024 US presidential election. There are so many instances where the West has been a supporter of the people of India and of Indian origin. It is quite unlikely, it seems to me, that the West is playing devil when it comes to awarding. Uh, I have stumbled upon something far more fundamental that is resisting the scientific rise of the country and I wish to highlight this thing in this particular podcast. Now, back in 2018, I read an article. It was by India Today. And in that article, uh, Steve Wozniak, who is uh, the co-founder of Apple, uh, he worked with Steve Jobs, uh, St- Steve Jobs back then, when uh, you know the foundations of Apple was happening. And he made a very, very uh, thought-provoking, at least to me, and very uh, provoking idea, provocative idea. The headline was this. Indians study hard, and this is this is Steve Wozniak. He's saying this. Uh, Indians study hard, get an MBA, maybe buy a Mercedes, but lack creativity. This was the heading of headline of the India Today article. Now I'll read a few lines from this article. Okay. So this is how the article begins. Indians can't be creative. A lot of people, many in India too, have suspected this. Now, this is an opinion of Steve Wozniak, who is the man behind Apple's first ever computer, Apple One, and company's co-founder with Steve Jobs. He says that Indian education system is based around studiousness and doesn't encourage creativity. In an interview, Wozniak also said that he does not believe that there will be any big tech company or breakthrough in India similar to Google, Facebook and Apple. According to Wozniak, India has just Infosys as an example of the big tech company. And even that is not innovative. He does not expect Infosys to be in the league of the global tech giants anytime soon. And the article continues. When asked to comment on uh, the uh, tech innovation in India by Economic Times, Wozniak said, <clears throat> and I'm quoting, I mean, the article is quoting him, I am not an anthropologist and I don't know <clears throat> the culture of India well enough. I don't see those big advances in tech companies. What is the biggest tech company here? Infosys, maybe? I just don't see that sort of thing coming out of Infosys. And I have done keynotes for them three times. 
He pointed out that Indians lack creativity and that people in India aren't encouraged to pursue creative careers. Again, the article quotes Wozniak. The culture here is one of success based on academic excellence, studying, learning, practicing and having a good job and a great life. And of course. So you see, that was the article. Okay. Now let's draw the brackets here. Let's narrow down the kind of people that we are trying to address. We are addressing the people who seek jobs in IT sector or management or engineering or medicine or those people that are, you know, preparing for civil services and of course the scientific career, scientific research. Now, the brain X in this podcast, I am not uh, going to talk about people f- only from, uh, you know, uh, I'm not going to talk about people from all different kinds of fields. But I'm going to just address these people from these backgrounds. We're excluding people from music, from art, from dance, from fine arts, from architecture and backgrounds like these. Because, you know, these kind of backgrounds are essentially creative. Now, <clears throat> this is the major problem. The problem of lack of creativity and adventure. And this problem is seen barely by anybody as a problem. If a person finds a good job, a good paying job, the life is settled. And this kind of mentality we have in India, he doesn't have to do anything further. He will receive respect in society, will be seen as a successful person. He or she will find a good partner. And this is the basic funda behind, you know, that, that mentality of government job still very very prevalent there is this idea woven into the very fabric of the society in india ever since the idea of government job was born find a government job and everything will be fine people avoid private jobs and private jobs are looked down upon because there is a very bad job security in private firms they can expel you at any time Plus, a private firm can ask you to work tirelessly all day. Something that maybe you don't see in common jobs. Sometimes, often maybe. And they could be paying you, these, these private firms could be paying you a sum of money barely enough for sustenance. I mean, imagine telling people that you have found a job. So the first question that they will ask is, is it a government job or is it a private job? And the moment you say it is a private job, and you always say that nervously, (laughs) elongated faces are seen everywhere. A subtle shade of disappointment, it appears on every face the moment you say it's a private job. I've joined joined a private firm. Now, when I used to raise this concern among the elderly I know, my seniors, they used to say that My dear, most of the country is struggling with a certain degree of poverty. And so, they really need to sustain. They really need a financial security, a financial backbone. In many cases, people don't have good support from family. And so, they need to, you know, secure a financial background, a financial stability at the earliest. So that, you know they can just live away from the obnoxious encounters with their family members. They don't have a good relationship with their family members. In many families, there are sisters who are to be wed, who are to be married at the earliest uh, possible age. Once the girls are too aged, nobody will marry them. This is also one of of the, uh, you know, stereotype of society. So, people want jobs, a settled life. In many families, there is nobody who is earning or maybe barely earning anything at all. And therefore, they need the financial security. Now, I totally understand these issues. Okay, Sustenance and the fulfillment of the basic necessity, the bare necessities of life are of paramount importance, no doubt about that. But I have seen this kind of tendency in, in people who have got a well-furnished houses, highly paid parents and so on. The parents who has, uh, who have good job generally expect their kids to get the same. This, I believe, is due to the peer pressure or rather the societal pressure on parents. A particular parent tends to do what society does in general. 
they simply follow the trend without a second thought also if their kids get a good job and by good job i mean a government job and not a private job that's the stereotype the steam their steam will rise in the society the family's steam so i mean to say that though at the level of poverty i am totally okay with this kind of setup okay but this setup doesn't disappear with the disappearance of the poverty of the family it continues well into the upper strands of the society where everything necessary for a comfortable life is is available plentifully because though now obtaining a government job is no more necessary for financial security rather now getting a government job is because of uh self esteem and so this baggage it continues perennially generation after generation until some individualistic and free thinking generation emerges down the lineage so i have now elaborated the basic issue at hand now this is the surface of the phenomena only the surface the thing is a little bit deeper i mean this is what really goes on apparently now let's dissect it a little bit okay what is the core of this problem philosophically speaking philosophically speaking i mean how is india's philosophical or religious influence on people responsible for this kind of problem so this is what i think there is this story of alexander alexander the great of macedonia of greece uh this story is often repeated in religious and spiritual and philosophical discourses across india alexander the great was the emperor of the ancient greek kingdom of uh macedonia he led many military campaigns and is known to have created one of the largest empires ever stretching from greece to the border line of india and he was pretty young at that age when he was doing all this now while leaving greece to conquer the world he met a fakir ha huh, of greece of on his way and he is a very famous fakir of greece he is called diogene he used to live naked <laughs> so he met diogene and told him that he wanted to conquer the world and uh, diogene asked why do you want to do that uh, alexander said mujhe maza aa jayega i'll be happy after doing that and diogene chuckled a little bit he 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 smiled and laughed a little bit and he said If you want to be happy come live with me. You'll be happy without having to do anything at all. Alexander didn't understand this proposal. He was perplexed. How can somebody be happy without doing anything at all without something happening to you? So he didn't understand him and he left him. Then years after fighting battles and conquering the world and creating a large empire while he was returning home he recalled his encounter with Diogenes. and it's very fascinating what really happened later he started to think about diogene what he used to say and he started he started looking at the whole uh everything that he did conquering the world and you know lots of bloodshed and so forth so he finally while he was returning to greece he died in babylon but while he was on his dead bed is still alive he asked his caretakers his generals that he had you know three wishes that he wanted to be fulfilled so alexander said see i um, guys i have these three wishes and please carry them out because i'll be dead soon please do this so my first wish is that you know my doctor should alone carry my coffin my second wish is that uh the path towards my grave as you will be moving it should be strewn with gold and silver and all the precious possessions of my treasury while my body is being you know brought to be buried and finally my third wish is that both my hands shall be kept dangling out of my coffin mere haath jo hain wo pasar dena bahar kar dena mere coffin se taki kyun wahi hai ki bhai the generals were startled by these three wishes they were like what kind of wishes are these so alexander said see there are reasons for this first i want my doctors to carry my coffin i want people to know that doctor can do no i mean he cannot cure somebody who is destined to die they are powerless they cannot save a person from death coming to the second wish alexander said 
that to strew the gold uh, strew the road with gold and silver and other precious stones on the way to the graveyard so that people will know that though i have myself spent the whole life accumulating all the treasury or the gold not even a single grain of gold i will be carrying with me as i leave this world now this is a sheer waste of time accumulating all the wealth energy it's it's a waste of energy it's a waste of peace of mind you know and when and this whole uh, thing of becoming extraordinary is just waste and finally coming to the third wish she said have my hands dangling out of the coffin because i want people to know that i am empty i came empty handed into this world and likewise i will go empty handed out of this world khali hath aaye the khali hath jayenge now <laughs> this legend of the last three wishes of alexander is often repeated in many many philosophical and spiritual discourses lectures uh, even though uh, there seems to be no documentary evidence for this uh, story but you see this is a story of the greatest emperor of the ancient world serves the purpose of other spiritual discourses khali hath aaye the khali hath jayenge to daudo mat the spiritual discourses of india intends to help people live a comfortable life it wants people to you know to relieve people of the burden of their randomly cooked up desires of chasing this or that wish to fulfillment and the whole idea of these spiritual discourses is doubtlessly logically consistent let me say this desire is indeed the cause of suffering as the buddha said the more the desire the more the effort to make it happen the bigger the desire the bigger the effort to make it happen and the world isn't a linear phenomena the world is not obliged to happen according to your wishes the world is too big there are just too many events and each event is influencing all the other events the world is a chaos of events and the best way to live a life a happy life is in a subtle sense retire from desiring itself desire no more and you shall be happy and you shall live a comf- you should you shall lead a comfortable life maybe a longer life even so the whole idea of spirituality is extremely consistent i have often myself i was um, I, i've been amazed by the sheer internal consistency lying within the theories of buddhist philosophy advaita philosophy vedanta philosophy myself being the student of philosophy The philosopher Sarvapalli Radhakrishnan who was the second president of our country he wrote of the Vedanta philosophy in his book uh and I'm quoting him it so he he wrote the Vedanta philosophy it has a self justifying wholeness characteristic of the works of art it expounds its own presuppositions is ruled by its own end and holds all its elements in a stable reasoned equipoise i cannot at any so, so end of quote i cannot um um at any point disagree with the idea of vedanta and buddha there is no internal uh, inconsistency to be disagreed with apparently but what it does is that it blunts a certain edge and people who could have done a great job with their sharp edge creativity shuns you become just too calm and too cool to take risks and lead an adventurous life you certainly start to take life as a playful activity but you no longer play with it you no longer play with life you just become a silent observer of events now while the west is uh, constantly playing with life why again there is a fundamental difference between the spirits of the two cultures in the west particularly in greece there is a legend the legend of achilles now, when i read about it for the first time i was quite surprised I was reading uh, Rebecca Goldstein she is the wife of Steven Pinker one of my favorite writers and she is a philosopher So I was reading Rebecca Goldstein's book uh, it was Plato at the Googleplex 
and in that book she actually narrates the you know the the entire event in a very beautiful way why do europe and this is how she actually begins why do europe and america admire greeks why do we admire greeks now you see remember every time a new chapter <laughs> इन हाई स्कूल टेक्स्ट बुक जो हमारी टेक्स्ट बुक्स रहा करती थी हाई स्कूल की इंटरमीडिएट की आप याद करिए कि वेन एवर देर वॉज अ न्यू चैप्टर इट ऑलवेज बिगैन विद अ टेक्निकल टर्म एंड दैट टेक्निकल टर्म वॉज डिराइव फ्रॉम ग्रीक एंड इट वॉज सो एंड सो साइंटिया मे बी एटोमोस मे बी है ना सो डिराइव फ्रॉम ग्रीक एंड इट मैंट सो एंड सो सो वॉट इज why uh, so much admiration for the greeks greeks certainly had achieved great intellectual progress by the time of aristotle finished his work but is there something apart from this intellectual tradition for which west admires the greeks rebecca goldstein in her book plato at the googleplex chapter number 3 she writes and i'm quoting her we don't admire the greeks for their morality and of course so what is that which greeks are admired for and drum rolls da 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 da, da. ethos of the extraordinary in other words the spirit that the unexceptional life is not worth is 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 not worth living an exceptional life is not worth living ethos of the extraordinary Let me summarize the story of Achilles in a few lines then we'll ponder over it and you will un- you will understand Achilles was a ferocious fighter he had a glorious fighting career several thousand years ago one day there was a giant battle he was supposed to fight in that greatest of all battles and he had two choices before entering the battle he could either fight and die by which his glory will live for life forever or he could go back home and live a cozy and comfortable life with his lovely family and friends but at the cost of his extraordinary glory his extraordinary achievements he had two choices if he returns back home he will be forgotten if he fights and dies he will live his name will live his name will live in the legends and folk tales in the form of poetry and songs of his people so he had to make a choice between these two after pondering over this he chose to die in the battle <laughs> he chose to live and die an extraordinary life people will always remember him this was uh, this act was you know about to set what is called the ethos of the extraordinary Rebecca in her book um she she writes by ethos of the extraordinary what you were meant what you were meant to think were the most glorious possibilities of human achievements you were meant to think of the most daunting reaches of human excellence of a sort to provoke to provoke other men's astonishment and put your name on many many lips you were meant to feel that here in that city of greece is the most exceptional of all city states ethos of the extraordinary had been realized as nowhere else on earth this is the most briefly summarized way of the idea of uh, ethos of the extraordinary the unexceptional life is not worth living and there in enters the legend of achilles she writes and i'll be quoting this is a long passage a little longer achilles is regarded as greeks uh, greece is the greatest mytho historical hero plato has socrates explain the choice that he makes when he is on trial for his life by comparing it to the choice of achilles and what is this choice Homer presents it as a choice between a short but extraordinary life or a long and ordinary life. In book 9 of Iliad, Achilles explains, Mother tells me the immortal goddess Thetis with her glistening feet 
that two fates will bear on me on the day of death if i hold out here and lay siege to troy my journey home is gone but my glory never dies and if i voyage back to the fatherland i love my pride my glory dies and here is the choice of achilles the ethos of the extraordinary is laid out in the starkest term, starkest terms end of quote most people in the west might not be familiar with this extraordinary of legends but this spirit lies hidden it seems in the psyche of almost every person who made a significant contribution or a big scientific discovery एंड मैं कभी कभी विज्ञान के भी बारे में जब सोचता हूँ तो मुझे लगता है कि अब देखिए उसका जो सिस्टम है द सिस्टम इज सच दैट वैन यू डिस्कवर समथिंग एक्स्ट्रॉडनरी वैन यू मेक अ बिग डिस्कवरी और एनी काइंड ऑफ डिस्कवरी इफ इट इज़ न्यू इफ इट इज़ एन ऑरिजिनल वर्क इट विल बी प्रिजर्व इन द हिस्ट्री योर नेम विल गो इन हिस्ट्री राइट एक्स्ट्रॉडनरी किया है सो इट सीम्स टू मी दैट this particular psyche is you know it's 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 hiding in every person who has made a big contribution in everything including science but this is also because this way of thinking is inspired by our death <laughs> this eth- ethos of the extraordinary is actually inspired by our death human immortality do something extraordinary or soon you can uh, uh, do something extraordinary so uh, as soon as you can uh, at the earliest because death is approaching jaldi se jaldi kuch bada kar lo kyunki maut bas aa hi rahi hai so death will completely erase everything about you your name your emotions your memory everything death will erase everything and most you can do to defeat death is to do something extraordinary in this life as early as possible once you have done that once you have done something extraordinary even though you will no longer live in this body you will live in the memories of pure people so do something extraordinary an ordinary life is not worth living however long and lavish and an extraordinary life is worth dying for however primordial and painful mujhe geeta ki ek line pata nahi kyon achanak yaad aa rahi hai swa dharma nidhanam shreya par dharma bhayavah anyway so this view of life you see has many problems first of all it is extremely business like hmm? it is too selfish it is too competitive it renders life a race to be won too much haste and impatience too noisy unstable and risky isn't it and it could be even violent and bloody at times now this was west coming to india here in india we have a calm quiet and comfortable system of life you know fostering deeper relationships music emotions contemplative and meditative uh, capable of offering you immense happiness causeless happiness the foundations of hinduism buddhism and other indian traditions of philosophy and spirituality are extremely strong the foundations maybe some day i'll make an episode elaborating its spell binding beauty and logical con- logical uh, consistency from my own perspective and i and i'm i really hoping that it's going to be a very very interesting podcast this indian thing is so beautiful and it's so calm and rich with with soothing emotions that frankly any receptive person at this very moment can slip into trance or what is called samadhi while listening to me gracefully utter these lines <laughs> it, it can offer you the deepest experience of life as a whole to be honest you can live every second of your life enjoy every second of your life with unprecedented joy but there is apparently a problem with it it seems to me when it comes to uh, adventure and creativity the more calm you are the more unlikely you are to live dangerously <laughs> until uh, there's an exception here until of course you 
uh, have understood the philosophy of this modern uh, mystic called Osho Rajneesh. <laughs> he is an exception in this regard. He isn't a traditional philosopher. So his uh, mysticism, his spirituality is living dangerously. In fact, there is a book uh, by the name uh, Living Dangerously. Very interesting idea. Anyway, so but, but but he is not a traditional philosopher. The traditional Indian philosophy, it, sh- it, 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 it appears to me, it shuns creativity, adventure and risk-taking kind of tendencies. The traditional Indian way of life also shuns creativity if taken at face value. You know, the idea that I'm about to express now will be offensive to many people. And they will find exceptions to the rule that I'm about to tell you. Maybe uh, I'll be roasted. Maybe I'll be insulted. You are free. Feel free to uh, insult me. <laughs> I have no choice, but I have to speak the, my, my carefully recorded observations here in this podcast. Uh, I have no choice, but to put it as mildly as I could. <laughs> and uh, I wish those that are listening to me, that, that you listen with a certain degree of um, uh, sincere introspection. Now, there are four Purusharthas. Char Purushartha in Hindu Dharma Shastra. Mein. Dharma, Artha, Kama, Moksha. Traditionally, it implies that one must live one's life while remaining within the confines, within the constraints set by Dharma. One should uh, uh, earn riches, money, artha, fulfill his or her dreams and desires, karma, and then ultimately uh, live a life of renunciation, detached so that one can achieve the highest of these purusharthas, which is the moksha or the freedom from the cycles of life and death. Now this way of life has been ingrained in the very fabric of Indian culture. I remember uh, Sadhguru ka ek video tha in which he was saying ke, this idea of you know finally when the whole life is lived finally you want moksha this even even a, an uneducated farmer he also asks moksha kaise milega uneducated farmer even uneducated people ask ki moksha kaise milega so so this is this 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 way of life grihastha uh, brahmacharya grihastha vanaprastha sanyasa you know along with the four purushartha dharma artha kama moksha hum isko apparently we don't re- we don't uh, we don't follow them rigorously but they are in a subtle sense in a subtle way ingrained in the very fabric of our society a person consequently lives life playfully because of this without seriousness like a child unattached to life without the tendency of stubbornness with life chilled out involved and yet retired <laughs> both at, both at the same time living this life as if it was a dream or a drama or wo shakespeare ki line jo aati hai as you like it mai the world is a stage and everyone merrily plays and moreover there are many many after lives as well so there is no worry <laughs> i'll be honest here except for that last assertion of many many lives after lives i see this way of living as the most mature perspective on living one's life honestly and frankly it is imbued with a sense of grace and to the scientist in me it is extremely consistent in contrast to the system of thinking i described earlier the ethos of the extraordinary this indian way of life is most beautifully lived life don't you think that there is nobody to compete with there is no business mindedness there is no haze there is no pain a relaxed and fulfilling life indeed a life of a buddha is the most mature way of life and i admit it but you see there's a problem the world we know of the kind of attitude that india has adopted since independence is fundamentally competitive way of life had jawaharlal nehru and baba saheb ambedkar and the whole constituent assembly and the whole country 
as well chosen to go along the lines the directions of mahatma gandhi's idealized gram swaraj kabhi padhiye kya hai kya idea tha gram swaraj ka so had we chosen to go along the lines of gram swaraj model of state we would not have to rethink our strategy today we as a country made a choice in the late 1940s we collectively made a constitution we collectively made this official agreement based on sovereignty based on socialism and democracy we don't have a choice we have to tirelessly work and compete with the world we have to take i mean we have to live dangerously we have to be adventurous we can't relax and live playfully nehru himself asked everyone not to relax i was reading this book by piyush babele nehru mitha kaur sat jisme there's a chapter uh, in and in that chapter there is a speech delivered to a batch of engineering students back in uh, 1956 jisme jawaharlal nehru kehte hain and i'm quoting main is bharat ko aaj ki duniya aur is aur pure aur aur purane itihas ke brihadatar sandarbh mein dekhta hu जब मैं इस तरह से देखता हूँ तो मुझे ऐसा लगता है कि दुनिया में जीने के लिए इस समय से ज़्यादा एक्साइटिंग जगह दूसरी नहीं है गौर करिएगा कि मैं एक्साइटिंग शब्द का प्रयोग कर रहा हूँ मैं आरामदायक और दूसरे किसी खुशनुमा लफ्ज़ का इस्तेमाल नहीं कर रहा भारत रहने के लिए एक कठिन जगह है और कठिन जगह रहेगा इसके बारे में कोई मुगालत नहीं होना चाहिए भारत में मज़े से रहने के लिए कोई जगह नहीं है या आराम के लिए भी बहुत गुंजाइश नहीं है एक्साइटिंग रचनात्मक और जोखिम भरा जीवन बिताने के लिए यहाँ पर भारत में जगह ही जगह है दिस नेहरू इज एक्चुअली स्पीकिंग टू इंजीनियरिंग स्टूडेंट्स टू फ्यूचर साइंटिस्ट टू फ्यूचर इंजीनियर्स कि एक्साइटिंग रचनात्मक और जोखिम भरा जीवन बिताने के लिए जगह ही जगह है यहाँ पर इतमान के लिए यहाँ पर आ, आराम के लिए कोई गुंजाइश नहीं है और ऐसा ही रहेगा बहुत समय तक द काइंड ऑफ कॉन्स्टिट्यूशन वी एज अ कंट्री एग्रीड अपॉन इट पुट्स अपॉन अस एन ऑब्लिगेशन दिस ऑब्लिगेशन इज नॉट टू रिलैक्स and keep competing with the world on so many frontiers we are already quite well i mean we are competing quite well in international diplomacy and economy today apparently <laughs> we have to begin to compete on scientific fronts as well not only because it is in a subtler sense our constitutional obligation but also because it is heavily exploratory it's full of exploration and advent and adventure it's an thrilling and exciting way of life there will be as many moments that will offer an individual thrill as there will be moments offering disappointments one cannot escape disappointments indian spirituality and indian way of life the one i described dharmarth kama moksha etc if taken at face value of course have a, has a, has a magical remedy for all your disappointments the way of the vedanta the way of the buddha will wipe out all the possibility of disappointment of life no doubt but they will also wipe out all the possibility of possibilities of worldly thrills as well it will in place offer you the thrill of the soul the song of the soul the trans of samadhi of nirvana of causeless floods of joy but you see once attained once you become a siddha yogi who bothers about the world <laughs> most enlightened people are self absorbed in samadhi and this self absorption grows to become so powerful that the yogi soon leaves the body as they say nevertheless to those people who wish to go on that pilgrimage it's totally fine i offer my warmest regards and my deep respect 
but to those people who are in the professional field like scientists and engineers i say to them we have to rethink our strategy our a life of comfort wherein you study hard crack exams you know get a job buy a mercedes mehnat hoti hai in sab mein of course but you know creativity wala part is mein nahi hai getting a mercedes you know then taking care of yourself fir then you retire uh, then then you live a life of a recluse or maybe wo gappe maarne wale jo senior citizens hote hain aap waise ho jaoge and then finally you die very late in life with this kind of attitude we as a country are very unlikely to be creative and innovative and adventurous and living dangerously it's very difficult more and more steve was near acts will mock us for our blunt creativity and no creativity in fact you've got to know the subtle difference between the two cultures and that's why i made this podcast i wanted to show you that what's really wrong what is that thing that we are unable to see and yet it is present persistent and we are unable to see and we are becoming victims of it i personally respect both the cultures both uh, the civilizations both the spirits but we have to change our strategies we have to rethink we have to be more serious about uh, our country let me put it more clearly in the west there was achilles he was uh, to fight a battle he could either fight and die and live a short life but extraordinary life or he could live a he could live a seem he could live a seamless cozy life with his loved ones at home thereby living a long long life but an ordinary life nonetheless the west has preserved the memories of achilles in their memories achilles is west's hero now do we have a hero in india <laughs> in india we have this boy nachiketa i see him as our hero because uh, he is so perfect <laughs> uh, once upon a time he came face to face with mr death mr yama the story is narrated in katha upanishad in this way yama asked him what boon do you want nachiketa said he wants to know the secret of life and the secret of death he wants to know the truth the plain truth and only the truth yama opposed and he reluctantly requested him to choose something else for his boon yama said that he could offer him you know lots of lavish life long life full of luxury and all the comforts and joys the world could offer the little nachiketa refused he asked stubbornly for a truth the param satya yama refused again nachiketa asked again yama refused again <laughs> and then finally yama had to give him Nachiketa chose truth and samadhi over the worldly life and luxury. The rishis of India have kept Nachiketa preserved in their memories. Nachiketa is India's hero. The Brainex group wants you to understand the difference between these two civilizations. Without understanding this, we are very unlikely to be risk takers or original innovators. we always want to be you know settled in life but to live an extraordinary life you've got to unsettle in some respect take risks launch yourself on an adventurous terrain explore the unexplored and opt to choose the road not taken this manner of thinking this way of life is capable of enthralling you it is capable of launching you like a rocket into unknown spaces you will not be able to sit idly let me tell you honestly this is that happens with me you will be constantly searching for this or that key to unlock the door and explore the uncharted territory non stop you will be unstoppable you cannot sit idly you will always be ready to break the monotony this this spirit is why apple corporations apple keeps everything a secret <laughs> 
This spirit is why Einstein he finished his general theory of relativity as early as he could. It took 10 years though. This spirit is why Charles Darwin hurried to publish his book which he was so nervous to publish for almost two decades only so that his rival Alfred Russel Wallace could not take the credit of the idea Darwin discovered first. The West is full of instances where this race, this ethos of the extraordinary was at play. In every paradigm shift in the language of Thomas Kuhn, the philosopher, there is this ethos of the extraordinary. We launched, India launched Chandrayaan 3. We were successful. As a citizen of India, I was enthralled. I was so, so happy. I was so satisfied that we did something extraordinary. But you see, this is not enough. We, we need not to stop here. We need to do something, something extraordinary now. Far more extraordinary than this. Moreover, to me, the success of Chandrayaan 3, it was an engineering success. It wasn't entirely a scientific success per se. Because in the case of scientific success, in, in, in case of scientific endeavors, the final destination, the final point, the final picture is not completely seen at the start. However, in engineering endeavors, we already know the success, the end, the end product. We know it at the very start. In the case of Chandrayaan 3, we could already visualize that finally the lander, the rover, it will land on the surface of the moon. In scientific success, we simply don't know where the line of reasoning where the line of research will carry us. We simply follow. Francis Crick and James Watson didn't know what the heredity of life, the DNA, would look like before they finally stumbled upon the success. Amundsen and Scott didn't know what the South Pole will look like before they finally reached there. You see, scientific success is unpredictable. Engineering success is predictable. You can visualize it. You can plan it. You can already know what the success final picture will look like. We as a country have to break the monotony and build an army of scientists for our country to compete with the developed nations of the West. It should begin. We must understand this difference between the two cultures. That's why I made this podcast. We must spot the psychological blind spot that is prevalent in our culture and in our, in our minds. Change the stereotype, change our strategies and endeavor to lead the race. We have the next 25 years to do this. As uh, Prime Minister Narendra Modi has given us, us a vision of this Amrit Kal. We need more scientists in the country full of enthusiasm and passion and romantic love affair with science and the thrill of discovery. Let's break the monotony together. If you like this podcast, do share, like and subscribe to it. It will help us reach more and more people and offer more substantial, more engaging and more enjoyable experience.